Okay, so hello, welcome everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conference so far. Um, very interesting times for us with the, the lockdown restrictions and the COVID. So uh, there'll be some slight deviation to, to what I would be doing um, had we been doing this face to face, but, but I'll try and do it in a way that, that doesn't detract from, from the overall. So um, I've very kindly been invited back this year to talk to you um, about some of the work I've been doing since my initial presentation at, at ISIPS last year. And the topic of today's discussion is going to be changing P PSO thinking one behavior at a time. Uh, my name's Chris Buckle. Uh, I'm a continuous improvement professional, and I recently completed my master's degree research with the University of Warwick. So to those of you who have been with us before, welcome back. And um, I'm sure we have some new members to the ISIPS and this may be your first ISIPS conference. So uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all uh, on behalf of myself. Um, again, just touching on the on the COVID restrictions, um, the plan was to do a much more interactive type workshop with you in groups um, in, in a room. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that this time around. But what I will be doing is showing you some, some specific examples and we'll be doing some kind of uh, periodic pausing throughout today's discussion and just to give you a chance to reflect and have a bit of a think and perhaps jot down a few notes. So um, I originally presented my, my research last year and it was very theoretical um, in nature um, and since then uh, I've been working with a couple of organizations within ISIPS and um, I was very kindly invited to, to come back and share a bit of, bit of an update with you and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. So um, thank you very much for having me. Um, we're doing some really interesting and, and breaking some new ground in terms of research um, at the moment and throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation, I'll, I'll be wrapping up with um, a bit of a case study that I've been doing with the National Institute of Health Research. So the agenda for today's presentation is going to be roughly in four sections. So we're going to, we're going to dive in a little bit to set the scene into continuous improvement in public sector. I'm then going to introduce or reintroduce for those of you that were with us last year. Um, we're going to touch on some, some change theory. And then I'm going to present um, the, the kind of core of my work and the diagnostic research models. Um, and then I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some, some real examples of how we've been taking that work forward. Um, so in terms of what you can expect to get out of today, um, I'm more than happy to share the materials from today's session. And the plan is that by the end of the presentation, you'll have um, some diagnostic models to actually go out and start applying in your own organizations. So with that in mind, we'll, um, we'll begin. So let's just do a bit of a recap to set the scene and give us some context for today's session. So continuous improvement isn't really new in public sector. We've been doing continuous improvement for probably around 20 to 30 years now. And throughout that time, we've really built up a huge amount of experience and knowledge, uh, particularly when it comes to practical application of the tools, methodologies, and techniques. Having said that, um, continuous improvement has largely been unsustained in public sector organizations. Uh, the results have been a little bit unpredictable and a bit sporadic. Um, and really that was my, my own experience um, as a lean change agent in the public sector really inspired me to uh, to kind of take that mantle on and do some academic research and, and, and look into some of the reasons why that's happened. So when we look back um, all the way back to the early 2000s, perhaps even a little bit further, we can see that approaches to continuous improvement have broadly remained the same. So we still see today um, a huge emphasis on cost reduction, removal of waste and internal efficiency. And when we look at the methodologies that public sector have adopted, um, as well as serving or service organizations in general, so we're talking about our leans, our Six Sigmas, um, it's not really surprising, or we shouldn't be surprised, that the emphasis has been on those cost reduction and waste removal, because that they are the, co the core principles of those methodologies. However, um, I think there's been a, a bit of a failure in, in some service organizations to recognize that we're not manufacturing um, and therefore the, the kind of adoption of these manufacturing originated tools and techniques has led to some 
uh, common, quite common barriers and uh, some recurring problems that we've seen over the last 10 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, the alarming thing for me when I was doing my literature review at the beginning of my research was I found out that we're still reporting the same problems that we were 10 years ago. Um, and that then suggests that public sector organizations have been going around in a loop. And I'm gonna talk you through that loop on this slide here. So I hope as we're going through this, some of it sounds a little bit familiar and might chime with you. So the first stage is that we hear or we discover a plausible sounding methodology that appears on the horizon. Um, it, it delivers prom promises of significant benefits. It then gets converted into a set of pre-packaged steps or tools or methodology. Um, and again, this is where we start to see the leans and the six sigmas and the very, very structured frameworks being introduced. And then the deployment and bandwagon effect begins. However, what we then start to see is over time, conventional thinking subverts the methodology and it kind of falls over. And this is where we talk about the, the lack of sustainment or the recurring problems and the, the, the universal barriers to change across all public sector organizations with very few exceptions. So we can start to see an emerging pattern here around some of the reasons why the methodologies haven't been sustained uh, and that's really down to conventional thinking. Um, so after a while disillusionment and cynicism sets in and we start to lose all the engagement uh, and all the enthusiasm that we had at the beginning and eventually we lose momentum altogether. And at that point rather than reflecting and perhaps learning some of those, those key lessons there, what we tend to do uh, and part of that happens quite naturally is that we start to look elsewhere, we start to look for a new solution, or we do a different project, or we start to look at, is there, is there a technology replacement to help solve this problem? And um, as, as I stated earlier, we can see this, um, we can see this loop uh, recurring over and over and over for almost you know, 10 to 15 years. And so the big question, that I decided to to kind of look at the the, the question that both from a, a uh, and also in the academic literature, which which still hasn't quite been addressed, is why is this happening? And for for your guys, for the for the people watching this the, this afternoon, really the key question is around well, what can we actually do about it? So I'm hoping to be able to convince you by the end of this presentation that that there's a way that we can do that. So let's consider the importance of reflection. So continuous improvement fails because we fail to address the organizational reasoning that's built into our culture. It's built into the way we manage our business on a day-to-day -day basis. We act it out every day. It's deep rooted. We often learn it um, when we come into an organization. It's often been that case that, that, that that's the culture and that's the, the reasoning that's often been in place for kind of 20, 30 years. It's often subconscious and intangible. Again, it's very hard to, uh, to kind of pin this down. Uh, and it's also something that happens instinctively because we've been doing it that way for, for that long. And critically, uh, and the, the kind of pinch point for, for this presentation today is that that really frames the way we apply our business improvement tools and techniques. And now the question I just want to put in your minds at this point is that is whether we really ever reflect on the governing logic and the impact it has on how we implement change. So let's introduce some theory at this point. So typically what happens in most organizations is that we, we decide on our methodology, we set out our objectives, and then we implement those, um, those changes. And depending on the consequences of those actions, we either um, we're, we're kind of satisfied that we've achieved what we want to achieve, or we then go back and we modify our actions in light of those those com consequences or the the outcomes of our actions. And this is commonly known as single loop learning. However, what we what we often don't do is when we're stuck in the single loop. Um, learning mode 
is that we don't actually take that extra step back and consider the what's called the governing variables, which is the thinking, the logic, and the values that actually inform and drive those actions. And now this is known as double loop learning, and this is going to be the, the kind of core of what I want to talk to you about today. Now, single and double loop learning theory came along in the 1990s. So it's a bit of a, we're sort of reinventing a bit of a classic here. And um, there's nothing new in the organizational psychology ecology literature about this, but this was originally pos posited by um, a group of academics led by Chris Argyris in the 1990s. So ladies and gentlemen, the game is afoot. It's time for us to put our deer stalker hats on and dig out our magnifying glasses and actually start going out into our business to expose these governing variables. Now, something that's quite an abstract concept in terms of, of governing variables, well, there are some specific things that we can look at and specific things we can examine, which will help us infer what our governing variables are. The first thing we can do is through observation. So what do we see? Secondly, we can, um, we can listen into discussions. So that's what do we hear? And thirdly, the governing variables are also expressed in our policy, our procedures, our processes, and our organizational rituals. So actually, we've got quite a, a wide variety of sources here that we can go and examine to help us unpick the governing variables. And once we've collected those examples, what we can do is we can begin to infer what those overarching thinking and values are from our empirical observations, we can begin to evaluate the espoused versus in use theories of action. Um, so what that means is what we say we do as an organization and how we act and how those behaviors manifest themselves um, are often quite different. And from that position of knowledge, we can then begin to disrupt the existing governing variables and we can start to think, well, what what would the what would the ideal governing variables be what should we be doing or what can we do instead and once we get to this point we actually see quite quickly and quite powerfully um, change can be positive change can be implemented quite quickly so what can we look for what can we observe that will give us an indication that we have some single loop learning behaviors well there's a list of things with, that we can look at um, including deep-rooted default organizational routines. What we say and what we do are often different, and by highlighting and pointing out those incongruences, we can really break the cycle. Uh, defensive reasoning, um, that's a particularly interesting phenomenon, defensive reasoning, because it, it's perfectly natural. Um, we all do it. Um, where it becomes a problem in terms of restricting organizational learning, and therefore, um, becoming a barrier to sustaining continuous improvement is when we become so defensive that we're, that we're very, um, re we're very, uh, what's the word, um, against changing or um, being very critical about the way we reflect. And, and defensive reasoning is probably the most difficult barrier we have to overcome. But I'll talk to you a bit later on in the slideshow about how we can get over that. Um, another suggestion that we have uh, embedded single loop behaviors in our business is a lack of evidence of change over time and history repeating itself. So we've already talked through the uh, the cycle um, earlier in the slide deck. And quite, quite often when I actually go out to businesses and I talk to people uh, and I ask them, well, have you got the evidence there that, that you've made progress and that you've changed over time? That's quite often one that, that people fall, fall short on. Um, and another classic indication of single loop learning is that we focus on the tools. So we really focus on the what rather than the why and the how. So this diagram here, this is the first of the diagnostic model that I'm gonna to present to you today. Um, and you, you're welcome to, uh, to take these away with you um, and use them as a tool to, to guide you um, back in your own organizations, is that it really explains um, on a page the, the phenomenon of single loop learning in public sector organizations at the moment. So as we can see, we have our current PSO paradigm, 
so underneath there in this the the box in the middle there we've got the uh, the kind of tenets of public service thinking um, command and control management user as a passive recipient of the service internal efficiency cost reduction and short-term scope and then when we follow that through the loop round to the right hand side we can see and hopefully some of you will recognize this in your own experiences of implement, implementing continuous improvement that we can see the effect that that has in terms of selection and deployment of, of continuous improvement methodology and the evaluation of, of outcomes. Critically with, with this single loop model is that we see the loop just going around and around between actions and outcomes rather than the really critical piece which is around reflecting on the governing logic and the variables that are driving those actions. So on a bit more of a positive note, we can also look and we can also identify double loop learning behaviors. And these are typically characterized by evidence of reflection and dynamic change. So we start to see deviation from existing organizational routines. We start to see new behaviors. We start to hear new questions. We get to observe conversations around people and teams challenging the status quo, that sort of well, why have we always done it like that? Is there a better way of doing it? Um, and consequently, when we start opening ourselves up to that way of thinking, we then start to bring in new sources of information and we start to experiment. And this really does open up the art of the possible um, in terms of continuous improvement and making sustainable change. And this is what a, con a continuous improvement double loop learning model might look like. Um, now, the first thing you might notice about this one is that I've left the ideal PSO paradigm, the governing variables. I've deliberately left that section blank because I'd like you just to reflect in the margins a little bit about what some of those tenets might be. If we give, given the, the, the kind of old version or the, the current version under a single loop method includes things like command and control, passive recipient, internal efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some really, really interesting work happening in the academic world at the moment on what an ideal PSO paradigm should be. Um, and there's some really, really interesting research out there things like systems thinking approach to service design, uh, the user as a key actor in value creation rather than being a passive recipient, service effectiveness versus internal efficiency, and adaptive service provision rather than short-term scope. Okay, so I'm going to present to you now a few extracts from my research. So my research was built on a series of interviews with internationally renowned continuous improvement experts. Um, and what I'd like to do is use some statements from them to illustrate the phenomenon of single and double loop learning in organizations. So as I, as I walk you through some of the examples, I'd just like you to, to keep in the back of your mind what we can infer about those governing variables. Are they describing a single loop or a double loop type behavior? And what could some of the implications be for sustaining continuous improvement? Now, this is the point where if we were doing a face-to-face -face, um, workshop, um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd, spl I'd be splitting you up in groups and I'd actually give you these statements um, on uh, kind of pieces of paper or through a, a kind of electronic um, kind of delivery system and I'd actually be giving you time to discuss and kind of challenge each other on your interpretation of some of these statements. So there's about 40 statements in total but I'm only going to show you a handful today in the interest of time. Um, but again I'll, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate a bit later on it. If you guys are interested in running a similar exercise on your team um, this will be a, this will give you a good flavor of the kind of approach that, that we might take. So let's example, let's examine, sorry, some, some real life examples of single and double loop learning behavior. So let's take this first one here. And if it didn't work, would they throw it in the bin or give them an opportunity to keep working through it? So do you think that's single loop or double loop learning? And I'm 
going to assume that most of you have got it correct. It's actually a classic single loop learning behavior. Um, as we can see, it's discouraging double loop learning behavior, particularly around challenging the status quo or experimentation. Um, and in terms of the damage that, that this does to sustaining continuous improvement is that um, as you'll be as you'll see, it really undermines the employee engagement, uh, ownership and employee enthusiasm. So let's have a look at another example now. Um, the thing that crushed the intervention, concern with avoidance of risk and proceduralizing away any potential blame that might find its way up the hierarchy. Um, and again, hopefully in the back of your minds, a light bulb moment might, might have occurred there. And that's really as um, a classic description of defensive reasoning at play. Um, and again, the, 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 the disadvantage this has in terms of sustaining continuous improvement is that it really can reinforce some negative culture elements. So we quite often talk about things like blame culture. Um, and that's a really good example of a, of a behavior that, that's not conducive to sustain continuous improvement. So in this next example here, we're actually showing some, some indication of double loop learning. So there's a couple of interesting points that, that I'll draw out of this. So firstly is that when we're, we're testing um, whether people have been empowered to make change, so we're starting to talk about things like maturity assessments and monitoring improvement over time, the emphasis on this particular statement is rather than do, do our people understand how to use the tools and techniques versus do they understand what level of change they're allowed to make? Now, this is it's quite a subtle difference, but it's quite powerful because we're talking about empowerment here. We're talking about giving our people the freedom to experiment. But what we're also doing is we're encouraging innovation versus just sticking to the tools and techniques that we might have pre-prescribed to them through our choice of lean or Six Sigma or whatever methodology we've, we've, um, we've chosen. Now, this is where the really powerful learning happens as we're not limited by those prescribed tools and techniques. So it's quite an interesting one, that. So moving on then, I've just got three more for you because I, I suspect at this point, you're kind of getting the picture. Um, and now this one, again, this is something that's really common in public sector organizations. And there's lots of really uh, genuine and understandable reasons for that, particularly in terms of the, the kind of financial and austerity pressure to deliver more with less um, isn't always conducive to creating an environment where we can be experimenting and we we have to learn very quickly because we don't necessarily have the resources to keep going back and trying it again. But this particular example talks about, on the one hand, asking our people to be innovative, uh, to chat, to think of new ways of doing things, but on the other hand, we're then going to tie them against a KPI that, that, that ties them to delivering quantity over quality. So in this particular sense, we might say that our espoused theories don't match our theories in use. So what, so what we're saying to our people isn't being manifested in the support and the way that we're encouraging them to behave. And that's a really good example of single loop learning. This next example here is, is where we can see that we're, we're starting to understand our, our organization as a system. We're starting to collaborate outside of the circles that we otherwise would because we're going to the front line and understanding what matters from the customer's point of view. And again, this is really, really powerful in terms of generating innovation um, and seeking out new sources of information. So these are the kind of behaviors that we really want to be encouraging in our organizations, particularly when it comes to um, collaborating across boundaries. And the last example here, I, I, I couldn't really resist not having this in because it's such a classic. Uh, and I hear it all the time. And even in the organizations that I've worked in since moving out of public sector, this is a, a real doozy that, that you do hear all the time. Um, and it's the one where our people or people just do things and they don't even question why we're doing it. Um, and again, 
that's a real indication that the organization is kind of stuck in a bit of a single loop learning. If we if we consider that our external environment and, and the, the customer groups and the service users we encounter is constantly, constantly changing. And therefore, as an organization, we need to also be constantly changing to adapt. However, when we see behaviors such, such as this, it really suggests that um, we're, we're protecting the status quo. Um, we're not encouraging our people to question, is this the best way of doing it? Why are we doing it this way? And therefore, in terms of CI sustainability, it makes it very difficult for a public sector organization to continue to meet those changing demands of our service users. So that's a really good example there of single loop. <clears throat> so how did you guys feel about that? I hope that some of you would have read some of those statements and straight away went, yep, yeah, that happens in my organization all the time. Did any of those statements, <clears throat> excuse me, describe anything that, you hit, that you've heard or felt or observed in your own organization? Um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the reality is that there is no uh, kind of ideal state to get to. Every organization has single and double loop learning behaviors. Um, the question for us is how can we embed those double loop learning and encourage those and address the single loop learning behaviors? <clears throat> Smashing, so in terms of kind of theory and, and my work, um, we, we've kind of come to the end of this part of the, <clears throat> excuse me a moment. <clears throat> we've kind of come to the end of this part of, of the session, really. Um, but, but where I think the particular value is of, of my talk today and where I'd really like to, I'd really like you to, to take away from is to talk you through a real life case study of some of the work I've been doing with NIHR to actually turn this from a, a very theoretical perspective into something real that delivers actual change. <clears throat> so just to just to set out, this is the approach th that we took. So it, it broadly evolved around Argyris's four-step model of um, the, pr the learning process. So the first activity and our efforts at the beginning was around creating individual awareness and really bringing to life those ideas around well how can we hear and how can we see and at, at what points in our organization can we get information to help us determine what our governing variables are and then from there we worked really hard to develop a, a uh, almost a, a mini culture but we created an environment where we were we were open and honest with each other it was we created a safe environment to to kind of point out and challenge conventional norms. Um, and then from there, we were able to identify the current theories in use. And then the, the next stage, which is the stage that we're, that we're sort of, we're at at this point is around um, undermining and, and, and changing those governing variables and developing new principles of action, fostering learning and aligning those actions to our new theories. So it really all started off with <clears throat> some interactive workshops. So I went out to a couple of organizations and um, we introduced the theory um, at a reasonably basic level, but we did take some time to kind of explore it a little bit. Um, and then the focus was really around creating our, our platform, which was around a bit like whenever we, um, whenever we conduct a continuous improvement event, we, we set out some ground rules at, at the beginning. And this was done in a very kind of similar way. So in order for this to work, it was really important that we created that that agreement that everybody would be frank and honest and we weren't we wouldn't kind of judge each other. Um, and that's really, really important, particularly if we think back to some of the earlier slides and the tenets of single loop learning around defensive reasoning uh, and unwillingness to challenge the status quo. So I think before before you start, we need you need to have a recognition or an acceptance that we're going to be willing to to kind of challenge some of those assumptions. Um, and then after the the initial workshops, um, we sort of moved into phase two, and this is where we we went back out into our business and we engaged with our people around let's start gathering some specific examples of single loop and double loop learning. 
And after a while, we kind of amassed enough where we were able to then start doing some analysis interpretation. Um, and phase three, which is really where we're starting to move into now, um, this is where we, we've kind of understood and we've examined the, the current governing variables. Um, and now it's around developing and testing new principles and implementing some change. So the purpose of this next slide here, I'm, I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but, but really it was just to show you um, the template that we, actually, that we um, divvied out to the people involved in the study. Um, and you can see the tabs running along the bottom here. So we gave them a bit, little bit of introductory information and we gave them a template and a list of symptoms so that as they were going out into the business so that we'd come out of the workshop um, and, and that in, 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 in everybody's heads, we had the, a bit of the theory and we had a kind of a new lens to, to go and consider when we were back, back at the desks, how to, how to look and how to hear and how to identify some of those indicators. And we provided a template for people to go and capture those. And that's really what this slide looks like here. So as you can see, over a period of two to three months, we captured over 60 real-time observations from um, a, a kind of quite, quite a, a diverse range of people in the business. So the actual capture exercise was led by CI champions, but it did involve talking to people in a range of teams um, dotted at various locations around the business. Um, so as you can see, it's really quite quickly um, you're able to gather a lot of data and start to frame it through the single and double loop learning. So that was a really interesting point for me, particularly when we took that example and then we started doing some quite high level thematic analysis and, and the, the kind of highlights of which are presented to you here. So straight away, we can, we can already make some, um, some insights around where the organization is at in terms of double and single loop learning. <clears throat> so we can see that there's a roughly half and half split on this one, which again is, um, this is quite, nobody's really done anything like this before. So at the moment, we don't really have any baseline to compare it to, but typically, we'd expect to see a kind of 50-50 split, maybe 60-40, given that single loop learning is, is relatively pervasive in public sector. So by grouping the, uh, the single and double loop examples into themes, we can really see some, some fantastic progress. Um, and again, this gives us a really good baseline moving forward. So we can see, for example, that with this particular organization, in terms of their culture, um, they're, they're quite good with the asking new questions and challenging status quo. So a quarter of all the examples we captured referred to that particular topic. So we can actually see um, we're doing quite well in some areas. And then the, the, the question becomes, well, how do we then expand that and share that into other areas of the business? Uh, on the flip side of that, we've also got a recognition here that there is a core of kind of single loop type behaviors particularly when it comes to deep rooted organizational routines. And that's really powerful as well, because it then gives us a focus to, to challenge and to, to narrow in on those particular areas. And, and also go out and look in other areas of the business and specifically look for these kind of behaviors so we can really understand the impact of that in sustaining continuous improvement. So that was really our sort of starting point. So from there, we started to do a, a very much deeper dive analysis where um, we actually started picking apart the individual um, examples. And then we would have some, some really interesting discussions around, well, let's drill down into this further and, and what can we infer? What's the governing variable that sits underneath that behavior? And when we started having these conversations, it became really, really powerful. So I'll just talk you through two specific ones um, rather than go through the entire list there. Um, again, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody offline or if anyone's interested in doing a kind of similar exercise, um, I'm quite happy to, to talk to you about that. So this one was a, a particular example around protectiveness around work streams. So given the, the COVID situation and the, the huge uh, and unpredictable disruption that caused to almost all businesses, um, particularly in 
service organizations, it forced us very quickly to, to adapt uh, and to, to come up with a new way to keep delivering our business, given that a lot of our people had been redeployed, for example. So the, the governing variable that we analyzed out of this particular example comes down to, again, that defensive reasoning stuff, the fear of blame, fear of admitting failure, discouraging from taking risk. And therefore, with that new understanding, we were then able to approach the discussions with the team and really engage with them around um, you know, how, how, they were, how they were measured, what people might lose if we change the way we work. So again, we're starting to manage some of that fear and some of that um, uncertainty and also making sure that we're getting the, the input from the people who, who we really need to be, the people that are going to be doing the job on the day-to-day -day basis. So the outcome of this particular one was really around kind of de-risking some of the disruption. Um, also, again, around overcoming resistance and that protectiveness. And um, importantly, the, the other kind of takeaway from this example is that we're starting to demonstrate now that our espoused theories and in-use theories are congruent. And that's a really important one for keeping people engaged and enthusiastic in sustaining CI. So the other example I'd like to show to you um, is was more taken from a from a double loop learning example, and therefore has become a an area of best practice which we'll look to carry on forward and apply in other areas. So this one was around how the uh, the trust reached out to its partner partner organisations and how it designed its particular service to them as a customer group in the light of double loop learning. So I think the key learning point um, from this example is the, the recognition here that instead of assuming they knew what the needs were, they actually actively went out and consulted with, the, with that customer group. And therefore that enabled them to design their service provision in a way that met the needs and provided value of, the, of their particular customer. So the outcome in, in this is, is a really powerful one, both in terms of this particular instance, but in terms of CI in, in general. So when we look at our leans and our Six Sigmas, we quite often talk about increasing value and only doing the value work for the customer. And this is a really good example of how they were able to do that by designing against demand, by getting a really clear and granular understanding of what the customer valued from that service and responding to ongoing changes in that demand. Um, and also, of course, noticing that they were able to increase their customer value without spending any extra money. So that's quite a, quite a relevant one for public sector as well. So there's just a couple of examples there to, to give you a bit of a flavor of, of the process and actually how it's now manifesting into genuine change and genuine improvement. So um, I'd just like to share with you a bit of feedback from my contact at NIHR, and hopefully that will encourage you guys to, to kind of start thinking about some of this in your own work areas. Um, and, and as I say, get in touch uh, if you're interested in doing something similar. So one of the things from my point of view was, how, what's, what's the value been of my research and my approach uh, on a practical basis in helping that particular organization improve. And some of the things that they fed back is that it, it provided them with a focus on action. It, we, they, we gave them a, a specific framework that really helped them take that step back and reflect. And this last point here, I think it was, was really, was very validating to hear that from, from the organization because they talk about how we discuss organizational culture, but actually having a framework that allows us to quantify that and give us real examples that we can't argue with. So organizational culture is one of these really trick, tricky things to address because um, it's almost, it's a bit of an apparition and it's very hard to pin down. But by using this framework, we've actually been able to give quantitative analysis on um, existing culture and therefore it's been really really powerful in tackling that. 
So in terms of some of the challenges and, and limitations to the exercise, um, I, I wouldn't sit here and kind of claim to you that, it, that it's all perfect and everything went smoothly and, and that, that it's, the, it's the answer to solving your organizational culture problems. Um, so in, in the interest of being kind of open and transparent, there have been some challenges as, as with anything. Um, so firstly, some of the, some of the theory, although at quite, a, quite a, a rudimentary level is quite easy to understand, in terms of actually converting that into when you're sitting at a desk listening to a conversation, it can actually get quite tricky. So it did take a bit of time for us. We had to kind of revisit some of the theory and hold a couple of follow-ups on that. Um, but again, that's just part of the, once everybody had the basic understanding, um, I think they found it relatively easy to go away and not just to capture, but of course, the goal the goal for me was really to to give them the tools and the and the confidence to do the analysis and make the changes themselves as well and i think we've we've got some evidence here that they're kind of up and running and they're able to do that and in terms of capturing the examples there was uh, naturally going to be a little bit of fear because it it involves the very thing that we're trying to challenge the status quo on um but the good news is because we had a mechanism to do that, we were still able to capture some of those examples. Um, and the only other limitation that we really had was that the, the group was, was quite a, a sort of narrow group. So I, ideally, or if we were to carry on going forward, we would look to expand that group and really offer this out to, to kind of all staff or, or a more representative section of the organization rather than a particular CI champion group. But that last one really is really is quite minor, given the, the kind of overall benefit of the exercise. <clears throat> and finally, this is my little bit of validation just to, just to share with you here. Um, I've just got a couple of quotes from from my contacts in an AH, OHR, asking them about, well, actually, kind of so what? Have we actually changed anything? Have we actually really set them on a on a path with something that they feel is meaningful? And ultimately, the problem that we're all trying to solve in, in ISIPs is how can we sustain continuous improvement? And I was really pleased to see that from the first workshop, um, people were were really excited. They were they were going out and they were they were kind of thinking in their own heads, taking the theory with them and applying it when they were capturing the examples. So that was really really positive for me. Um, and the, and the other the other point is is a slight acknowledgement to say that actually. We've still got quite a long way to go with this, but we've definitely started on a, on, on a good road that, that hopefully will lead us to genuinely changing culture and behaviors for the best. Um, so just to wrap up then, um, so, so we know in our organizations, our system and our performance is usually visible. So we design our structures, our processes, our procedures, we deploy our people, and we can monitor our performance, we can measure the number of applications we process, we can measure customer satisfaction. But the key takeaway that I'd really like to kind of highlight to you guys today is that, that that's the visible side of the business. Sitting underneath that, which drives that visible stuff, is the thinking, it's the, the values, it's the logic that we use. And this is often invisible. And it's really, really important that as PSOs, we start to get a grip on that and start to be a bit smarter about the way that we deploy continuous improvement. Otherwise, we'll just keep going around in that loop and we'll have a real sustainability problem. So this is the last slide for me today. I just want to kind of recap some of the key takeaways. So what we've got here uh, and what we're developing at the moment is a framework or a, a method for understanding culture. Um, and that's a really exciting thing to be part of in public sector. Um, and not just that, in industry in general, um, there aren't very many cultural frameworks. Um, and therefore, what we're doing as part of these case studies is really paving the way. And I think that's credit to NIHR and also ICIPS in general for, um, for giving us that platform to work together and network and, and kind of share, um, share research with each other. So that really is a fantastic achievement. Um, the second point is around exposing governing variables. We can't change the culture unless we know what the elements of that culture is. Um, and hopefully today I've given you a couple of frameworks and some, 
some ideas about how you can start going to think about the own, your own culture and your own governing variables in your organization. We can then critically reflect on the implications of those governing variables in terms of sustaining CI. And ultimately, guys, the reason we're all here, the reason I'm in a job, it's around sustaining change. And in order to do that, we've got to change the way we think. So we've got to address those cultural elements and improve the process at the same time. Um, and really, guys, you know, thank you very much. That That's kind of it for me. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be returning to ISIPS. And I hope you found some of that interesting. Um, my contact details are available on the bottom of the screen there, and we'll make sure they get shared. I would absolutely welcome any questions or challenges or concerns. Um, you can get in touch with me anytime, and we'll, uh, we'll set up a call. So uh, once again, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.